This first chapter of differential calculus is on average rates of change, instantaneous rates of change. Um, the mathematical concept is the derivative that encodes instantaneous rates of change. Um, and to get from average rates of change to instantaneous rates of change, we'll have to uh, define, uh, discuss the notion of a limit. But this first section of the chapter is just on average rates of change. Um, the world around us is in a continual state of change. Uh, the position of an object changes with respect to time. That rate of change has a name, velocity. The velocity of an object can change with respect to time. And the rate of change of velocity with respect to time has a name. It's acceleration. Um, the radius of a balloon, as you inflate the balloon, changes with the volume of the balloon. Like many rates of change, that one has no name, no specific name like velocity or acceleration. You just have to say that whole phrase, um, the, instant, or the, uh, the rate of change of the radius of the balloon with respect to the volume. Um, other things change. There's the price of a lobster changes with the weight of the lobster. The, the area of a flat, widescreen television changes with respect to the diagonal length, the, uh, the y-coordinate of the graph of a function changes as a function of the x-coordinate. We want to look at various kinds of rates of change and in this section just talk about what average rate of change means. So, um, it's, as an example, suppose, so our first example, we'll have a lot of examples. Suppose a car is traveling a straight road and at time at noon the driver notices that she passes mile marker. There are mile markers on lots of roads. She passes mile marker 37. And at 12.02, passes mile marker 38. And the question is, what was the velocity of the car? during those two minutes. Well, hopefully you hear that question and you go, uh, what do you mean? What was the velocity of the car during those two minutes? Uh, do you mean, I mean, assuming that we're talking about motion in the positive direction, so whatever direction the person is traveling in, the positive direction, the Velocity could mean what you read from the speedometer at any time. So this question could mean, tell me the velocity at every single time between zero and, uh, between time noon, which I'm thinking of as time zero, and time 12.02. Um, clearly we don't have enough data for that. That velocity that you read off the speedometer, noting that you're moving in the positive direction, is, um, is the instantaneous velocity. It's telling you at any particular time how fast you're going. We don't have enough data to calculate that, but what we do have enough data to calculate is what you probably thought of immediately, which is, oh, well, um, the car went from mile marker 37 to 38, so the, the change in position
over the change in time, the, the, the car went one mile, the change in position it went to from 37 miles to 38 miles, so the change in the position, it went one mile. And in how much time? Well, if we want this in hours, that's uh, two minutes is two sixtieths of an hour, so one thirtieth of an hour. So what was the velocity of the car during those two minutes? Well, what a lot of people would mean is this number, the 38 minus 37 miles, so the one mile divided by the one thirtieth of an hour or 30 miles per hour. This, this quantity is, if we're trying to be careful, which we are, you know, the instantaneous velocity would be what you'd read off the speedometer. Once again, assuming you're moving in a positive direction. But this is not instantaneous. This is your change in position over your change in time. And this is what we call the average velocity. between noon and 12.02 p.m. All right, so hopefully that seems very familiar to you. You've probably made that calculation before in your life. Um, okay, so how do we kind of encode this mathematically? We, we want to give a name to the position function. So to make this look more mathematical and to let us generalize what we're doing to other cases, we're going to give a name to the position function. So let's let... Let P of T equal the position of the car as measured by the mile markers at time T hours. So this looks much more mathematical. And then what did we just calculate to calculate the average velocity? The average velocity that we calculated was just, well, the change in position over the change in time uh, between, uh, between, if it was t hours from noon, we went from t equals 0 to t equals in hours 1 30th of an hour. And our average velocity was the change in position. So it's the change in P. So we frequently abbreviate and don't write the explicit of T. The change in P over the change in T. And this is now to write it in functional notation. P of 1 30th, your position at time 1 30th, that's your position at noon, minus the position at time 0 over the change in time, which is the, the final 1 30th minus the initial 0. Um, we haven't changed anything we're doing. This is what we calculated before. This is the 38 minus 37 divided by 1 30th, and it's 30 miles per hour. We just wrote it in kind of a more mathematical way. All right, well, this, this phrase change in comes up over and over and over again. And so we use a, we like to abbreviate that with a symbol. 
and I don't know who came up with this, but the symbol that we use for change in is a capital Greek delta. So delta P over delta T, this is a delta. change in. So we calculate delta P over delta T um, and that gives us the average velocity. Okay, I, I want to warn you about a common mistake. Um, it's a frightening mistake. This is the average velocity and it's the change in position over the change in time. What it is not is the average of two velocities. And the, the English here is very, uh, I don't know, it's easy to get confused. When we talk about the average of a collection of numbers, what we mean is you add them all together and divide by the total number of numbers. This is not the average of two velocities. You're not adding two velocities and dividing by two. This is the average velocity, not average of velocities. It's, uh, you need to be careful. The average velocity means the change in position over the change in time. We couldn't calculate an average of two velocities here. We don't have any velocities, but in other problems, you might have the data on the instantaneous velocity also, and it's important that you not you know, add two of those velocities and divide by two to produce the average velocity, because that's not what it means. Um, so, we want to generalize this, this kind of change in one function divided by the change in the, the change in the dependent variable divided by the change in the independent variable. So um, we could keep using P and T, but kind of favorite function names are you know, like Y and F of X. And so just make a definition. If you've got some function, y equals f of x, so, but the letters really aren't important. So in our last example, it wasn't, it was p and t, not f and x. But if you have y equals f of x, then the average rate of change, and this phrase comes up so much, I'm going to abbreviate this the average rate of change. So I'll abbreviate that as AROC of F between uh, the average rate of change of F with respect to X. You have to say what it's with respect to, although if you don't say what it's with respect to and you've only specified like one variable that it depends on, it would, should be that one by default. With respect to x, um, between x equals a and x equals b is, well, it's just I could write the change in y over the change in x, or the, if you've called it, if the function's f, you write the change in f over the change in x. It's just the value of your function at like, what you're thinking of as the final x value minus the value at the initial x value divided by the change in x, so b minus a. I need to make a couple of comments here. Of course, we need a and B not to be the same since we're dividing by their difference. So we need A is unequal to B. My other comment is I was saying what we're thinking of is the final X value. In fact, it doesn't matter which order you take them in because if, if you did F of A minus F of B, as long as you're consistent and in the denominator also put A first and then B, of course these fractions are the same because you've negated the numerator and the denominator. Um, but typically we have one value that we're thinking of as the final one and one is the initial one. We usually put the smaller value here and the bigger value there. It's not necessary, but that's what I think I'll always do. 
Um, we also say, assuming, so let me assume that since A is unequal to B, one of them is bigger than the other, I'm going to assume that A is the smaller one, and then this will be my preferred way of writing the average rate of change. Um, and then this is also called, instead of between X equals A and X equals B, sometimes we'll say on the interval. A, B. That's another way of saying between X equals A and X equals B is to say the average rate of change of F on, with respect to X on the interval, the closed interval, the, those little horizontal line segments mean the closed interval, so including A and B. All right, so that's the average rate of change. It is important to realize what its units are. The units of this quotient will, you know, physical units like miles and hours, things like that. The, this numerator would have F units, because here's F, and we've got F minus F, so this has the units of F. The denominator has units of X, so the units of this, and it's important, units are the F units divided by the X units, so that, for instance, in our in our only example so far, F was in miles, so it was P, and it was in miles, and X wasn't X, it was T, and it was in hours, and we came out with something in miles per hour. So F units divided by X units. So this is our notion of the average rate of change. It's, it's uh, supposed to seem kind of intuitive, since you're familiar with average velocity, probably. Um, but if it doesn't seem familiar, this is our definition. And that's what we're going to go with. So um, let's look at a different example. Um, not position as a function of time, but velocity as a function of time. So. an example. Suppose car is moving on a straight road. A car. is moving um, on a straight road. So not in Boston. <laughs> on a straight road. Um, and at times, zero, one, and five hours measured from some initial starting time, the car is moving at It's moving, and I mean in the positive direction, the car is moving at 30, 60, and 40 miles per hour, respectively. And the question is, what are the average accelerations of a car? on the intervals from 0 to 1. Uh, let's go 0 to 1, 0 to 5, and 1 to 5. Okay, 
Well, you have to know what average acceleration means, and I said it earlier, but you need to, if you don't have an intuitive concept of acceleration and you don't remember what I said earlier, what is acceleration? You think, ah, acceleration, that's the rate at which my velocity is changing. So, yes, average acceleration means the average rate of change, the average rate of change of velocity with respect to time. As I said before, most average rates of change don't have names, but these are two of the big ones. The average rate of change of position, or the rate of change of position with respect to time is velocity, and the rate of change of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. So, uh, the average accelerations, well now we just calculate. You're given the data. So, So, average acceleration it is the change in velocity over the change in time. That's its definition. And then you just calculate this three different times. So, on the interval on the interval from 0 to 1 we were, all right, let me not misread this. Uh, at time one hour, we were going 60 miles per hour. At time zero, we're going 30. And that's the change in time. Is this, so you get 30 divided by one, you get 30 units. These units divided by these units. This was miles per hour. Right? These were the velocity. I could have written that here, but. So change velocity, so this is miles per hour, per hour. So miles per hour, I'm not going to write MPH, miles per hour, per hour. Um, I, in, a lot of people will do algebra with the units, and there will be times when I'll do that. So a lot of people here would write 30 miles per hour squared. In a way, this destroys some of the intuitive meaning of the units. Like, what, what the, what's a square hour? <laughs> but, so, I prefer to leave it like this until it gets um, too cumbersome. 30 miles per hour per hour, that's your acceleration, your average acceleration. The, your velocity cha changed by 30 miles per hour in one hour. So, I like to leave it like this, but if you want to do the algebra with the units, that's fine too. Um, on the interval from 0 to 5. Well, you know what you do. You take your velocity at time 5 hours. So at time 5 hours, we're going 40 miles per hour. At time 0, um, at time zero we're still going 30. And the change in time is 5 minus 0. So you get 10 over 5, you get 2 miles per hour per hour. So over the whole interval from 0 to 5, the average velocity was 2 miles per hour. Uh, ah, the average acceleration was 2 miles per hour per hour. Um, okay, what about on the interval from 1 to 5? Well, then you plug in your velocity at time 5, so that's 40, minus your velocity at time 1, which was 60, and you divide by the change in time, 5 minus 1. So you get min minus 20 over 4, so you get minus 5 miles per hour per hour. All right. Um, you sh maybe it doesn't bother you at all, but or maybe it does. We got a negative number. What does that mean for a negative average acceleration? Well, it means on average you were decelerating, you, you were braking on average. 
um, your velocity, your average velocity was going down. That's the, the negative sign. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, the, there will be times when you get minus signs and it just means you know, a, a negative rate of change means something, whatever function you've got, was decreasing. All right, so that's an example with average acceleration. Um, let's look at, we, I've got a bunch of examples I want to look at. Let's look at a widescreen television. Um, just so that you know that not all rates of change are with respect to time and that it's not all about motion of objects. So you might wonder, <laughs> you, you hear about televisions in widescreen format, 16 by 9 format, and the, uh, the diagonal measurement that's usually specified, size of the television is usually specified by the diagonal measurement and you might, and then you'll see things like, oh, if you, you know, if you do this to the diagonal measurement, it does this to the area. Well, that's, that's if you double the diagonal measurement. What does that do to the area of your television? So that's the question of what's the rate of change of the area with respect to the diagonal measurement of the television. So let's suppose we have a 16 by 9 television. That's the standard widescreen format. Um, so I'm assuming this is a 16 by 9 um, flat, so that we don't have to worry about <laughs> the surface curving to, to talk about the area. We would like to know what flat TV. We would like to know what is the average rate of change. the area with respect to the diagonal measurement. So it's the diagonal length. Which I'll call D. Um, between d equals 32 inches and 40 inches. And we'll also calculate the one between d equals 40 inches and d equals 52 inches. All right. All right, so this is our question. It's a little harder to get started with this one. In the, in the other problems, I just kind of specified, I gave you numbers. Oh, at this time you're here, at this time the velocity was this. In this one, not only will, do we not have specific numbers, we have to come up with, we have a, we'll have a formula, but we have to come up with a formula given that it's a 16 by 9 television, we have to come up with a formula for the area in terms of the diagonal measurement. Um, it's not particularly difficult, but you know, you have to, it, takes, it takes a little thought. So what does it mean to be 16 by 9? Well, it means that this side, this long side, is 16 times something, and whatever this is, it's nine times that thing, so that the ratio of, of this side to that side is 16, 16x divided by 9x, 16 by 9. x could be anything. Um, of course, the x would determine the diagonal measurement, but the point is, just saying that the ratio of the television is 16 by 9 means that this is 16 times something and this is nine times the same thing. And then our diagonal measurement, Yes, well, it should be here. Uh, yeah. All right, so here's the diagonal measurement. And what we'd like to do is write a formula for the area of the screen in terms of the diagonal measurement. Now, it takes some thought, but the area of a rectangle is certainly the length times the width. So it's easy to write the area in terms of x, so the area. A 
It's certainly the length times the width, so 16x times 9x, so that's 144x squared. But we don't want it. That's the area in terms of x, and if we were asked for the rate of change of the area with respect to x, well, we could leave it like this, but we want this in terms of the diagonal measurement. And so somehow we have to get a relationship between x and d. Um, if you come back over here, and let me make this line look straighter, <laughs> this is a right triangle. And you have the Pythagorean theorem that this side squared plus this side squared equals the hypotenuse squared, and that is how you get a relationship between x and d. So you get 9x squared plus 16x squared has to equal d squared. Yes, we have to do all this to find the average rate of change. You have to, you have, to have the data about um, whatever you're looking for the average rate of change of. You have to have the data of, of its value at the, at the values of the independent variable that you care about. So we need to do this. Um, this is 81x squared. This is 256x squared was d squared. This is adding without a calculator. This is um, 7, 337x squared equals d squared. Um, and so x squared is d squared over 337. And then finally, we've got what we want because this is 144x squared, but now you put in that x squared is d squared. And so what you get is A is, it's not very attractive, is 144 over 337 d squared. Okay, yeah, 144 over 337 is fairly ugly, but it is what it is. And now we can answer the question that we were at now. Now it's easy. That was the hard part. And that's frequently the case in um, problems in calculus, that when you've got a word problem, trans just translating it into a math problem is the hard part. Solving the math problem is frequently the easier piece. Um, so what is it that we want? We want to calculate delta A, the change in the area over the change in the diagonal. First, where we go from 32 to 40 inches. This should have said inches. I may have said it. I didn't write it. So we want A at 40 minus A at 32 over the change in D, which is 40 minus 32. So um, at this point, you, well, I guess we could do the denominator first, but we have to plug this into our function now. Let me write it over here for convenience. A is 144 over 337 d squared. All right, so first we plug in 40. So you get 144 over 337 times 40 squared. And then you get minus 144 over 3. 37 times 32 squared, and you divide by 40 minus 32, which is 8. The units here, these are, these are square inches, and these are inches. This comes out in square inches per inch, and it's, if you do algebra with the units, yes, you can just write inches. But that kind of destroys the physical meaning. You're talking about square inches of area per inch of diagonal length. I'm just going to leave it as square inches per, per inch. Uh, you can calculate that number. I mean, you could pull out a 144 over 337 if you want times 40 squared minus 32 squared over 8 um, inches per square inch. If you want this as a decimal, well, get out a calculator. I have cheated and have written it down. Um, you know, that's the answer in inches, in square inches per inch. 
but it is approximately to way more decimal places than you'd actually care about if you're television shopping. 30.7656 square inches per inch. Okay, that's from 32 to 40 inches. What's the average rate of change in the area um, between the diagonal measurements of 40 inches to 52 inches? You do exactly what we just did, except instead of using 40 and 32, use 52 and 40. So you put a 52 here and a 40, and a 52 and a 40. Um, you get a 52 here and a 40. And this is now 12. And again, it's in square inches per inch. And you can factor out the 144 over 337 if you want. But as I did, you're probably going to get out a calculator at some point and see that this is approximately 39.3116 square inches per inch. All right. So that's an example where the independent variable is not time, and it's not about the motion of an object. Um, why don't we look at an example that has to do with graphs or just what kind of um, abstract function, an abstract function at first, no physical problem, and then we'll relate it to a graph. So the problem that I want is So this will seem easy compared to all the words and the extra work in the last one. But it'll still be not just numbers that are being specified, but you'll have a formula. Um, suppose y equals f of x equals 4 minus x squared. What is the average rate of change of y with respect to x on the intervals 1, 2, and 1, 1.5. All right. Well, hopefully this doesn't seem too difficult to you. It's just the average rate of change of y. So you'll take the change in y with respect to x so divided by the change in x. So what you'll calculate twice is the change in y over the change in x. Um, so on this interval, so on 1, 2, that would be you take f, or you could call it y, at, you want the y, the value of y at 2 minus the value of y at 1. We've given it the name f of x, so it's, you can take f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. So um, what's f of 2, you plug in 2, you get 4 minus 4, so you get 0. f of 1, um, you get 4 minus 1, so 1 squared is 1, so 4 minus 1, so you get 3, so this is minus 3 over 1, so this is minus 3. Units, we don't have any units, so it's just this abstract number, minus 3. On the interval from 1 to 1.5, You basically do the same thing, except now instead of 2, you've got 1.5. So f of 1.5, ah, it's a little tougher. 1.5 squared is 
So 4 minus 2.25, 1.75, minus f of 1. f of 1 is still 3. All divided by 1 minus 0 0.5, which is 0.5. Um, or what's the same thing? Dividing by 0.5 is the same as multiplying by 2, so if it makes you happier or makes the algebra easier for you, you can, you can change this dividing by 0.5 to multiplying the numerator by 2. 2 times 0.75 is 1.5, so we get plus a 2, so we get 3.5 minus, we're multiplying the whole numerator by 2, we get a 3.5 minus 6, so a minus 2.5. All right, so what do these numbers tell us? Well, they tell us the average rate of change of y with respect to x. But hopefully in this example, when, I, when I've written the change in y over the change in x, that rings a bell. You remember, oh, I, the change in y over the change in x, that looks like the slope of a line. And it is the slope of a line. The question is, or these are slopes of lines. But what lines are they, and what do they have to do with this function? Well, let's look at it. So I don't expect you to know many graphs off the top of your heads, but that one is certainly a parabola it, because it's y equals quadratic thing. The minus sign in front of the x squared means it curves downward. Its biggest value will be 4. So you really should be able to graph this without a graphing calculator, but hey, if you have to use a graphing calculator, use a graphing calculator. So it's a parabola. It curves downward, takes it 4. I'm not going to worry about my scale too much, but it'll certainly cross the, the x-axis. The x-axis is where y is 0, so that occurs when x is plus or minus 2. So you get that. What are we calculating when we look at it? It looks like we're calculating the slope of a line. Like delta y, delta x, when we were on the interval um, 1, 2, well, we're taking, we took the value at 2 minus the value at 1 over 2 minus 1. What line would that be the slope of? Well, the, it's the line that um, goes between the corresponding points on the graph. What corresponding points on the graph? When, um, there's, when x is 1, let me use colored chalk. So when x is 1, you're up here. This point has coordinates 1, f of 1. But f of 1 is 3. This has coordinates 1, 3. This point has coordinates 2. It's a point on the graph that has coordinate 2, f of 2. But f of 2 is 0. And so what, what line is this the slope of? Oh, the most obvious one is this line that connects those two points on the graph. And if you had to calculate the slope of this line, you could take the change in the y-coordinate, so f of 2 minus f of 1, divided by the change in the x-coordinate, 2 minus 1. That average rate of change is the slope of this, the corresponding line. It's the line between the corresponding points on the graph. So we give a line like that that goes between two points on the name, uh, it goes between two points on the graph name. This is called a secant line to the graph. If y equals f of x. And for us, if you want to picture average rates of change, you picture the slopes of secant lines. So Right? This, this is the big deal, that how do you graphically see average rates of change? 
the equal slopes equals the slope of the corresponding secant limit. So that, for instance, you, you should be able to, why is this useful? You should be able to look at this graph, see those two points are on this line, and you should have known for a long time that that line has negative slope. Positive slope goes roughly from the lower left to the upper right. Negative slope goes roughly from the upper left to the lower right. This line has negative slope. Well, we found a negative, a negative average rate of change of minus 3. Um, on the interval from 1 to 1 1.5, yeah, that, that too is the slope of a secant line, but a different secant line. Let me switch to blue. Um, I should have drawn my graph bigger. But if you go to x equals 1.5 and you go up to the corresponding point on the graph, this point would have coordinates 1.5, f of 1.5. And the average rate of change that we calculated between 1 and 1.5 would be the slope of the secant line, a different secant line, the one that goes between this point and this point. So instead of the yellow line, it would be this blue line. <laughs> My lines aren't very straight. That is supposed to have slope negative 2.5. So anyway, um, I hope you get the idea. I'm laughing at my, at my own graphs, but it, it's not a very hard idea, but if you want to picture the average rate of change of a function, graphically, you graph the function, and then the average rate of change between two values of the independent variable, you just um, mark the corresponding points on the graph for, that correspond to those values of the independent variable. You draw the straight line connecting them, and the slope of that line is the average rate of change of the function on that interval. All right. Um, what else do I want to do? I want to do one more complicated example, not of secant lines, but of average rates of change. And then I want to very carefully say what average velocity and average acceleration are. And then I want to do one more example of average velocity. So let's, um, let me start with Another example where it's a physical rate of change, um, but it doesn't have a name, at least <laughs> one that I'm familiar with, so I just have to say the whole thing. So suppose you've got a perfectly spherical balloon that stays perfectly spherical as you're inflating it. So, okay, you can almost do that. So we've got a spherical balloon. And my question is, what is the average rate of change of the radius of the balloon with respect to the volume? as the volume goes from 20 cubic inches to 30 cubic inches. All right, there's the question. Um, kind of like our flat screen television example, this one requires you to, well, this one's not derive a formula so much. I mean, you do. But in this one, you have to know a formula, so either have it memorized or look it up, um, for the volume of, of a balloon, uh, a volume of a sphere. And what you should either remember or look up is the volume. 
and hopefully this sounds familiar, is 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. So that's the radius. All right. So you have to know this to do this problem. So if you don't know it, now you do. Or if you didn't know it, now you do. But whereas for the rate of change of the radius with respect to the volume, not the volume with respect to the radius, if we were asked for the rate of change of the volume with respect to the radius, this is how we'd want to leave the formula, and then we just would have two radii, and we'd plug them in and take the change in the volume over the change in the radius. But we need the change in the radius over the change in the volume. And that means we need the radius written as a function of the volume, not the volume written as a function of the radius. So uh, it's not as though it's difficult. You divide both sides by 4 thirds pi, and you take cube roots to get r as a function of v. So you do that. Um, you get r cubed equals the volume divided by 4 thirds pi. You could invert this four thirds if you if you want and leave right this is 3v over 4 pi um, and then you need to take cube roots so r is the cube root or an exponential notation 3v over 4 pi to the one third power cube taking cube roots extracting the one third power same thing um, and what do we need to do? We need the change in R over the change in V. And as V goes from 20 to 30 cubic inches. So you need to calculate from 20 to 30, you need to calculate this minus what you get it. at 20, um, all divided by the change in volume, so 30 minus 20. This is in these units up here, in inches. These units down here in cubic inches. Again, you know, you could write, simplify and write 1 over square inches, but inches of radius per cubic inch of volume. Just leave it that way. To get a decimal answer, I mean, this is going to be something completely hideous. At the dividing by 4 pi, taking cube roots. I can't do it in my head. Well, it's true. Tr I could work it out to lots of to desired accuracy. But it would take a long time. But again, I wrote this one down. It's, um, this comes out to be approximately 0 0.024368321. Inches per cubic inch. All right. Um, I've pretty much finished with the examples of, of average rates of change, except because motion and velocity, average velocity and acceleration come up so often, I want to uh, be more careful about defining those. And I want to talk about average speed versus average velocity, and then do one last example or two last examples, depending on how you count. So what's the problem? This is a one variable calculus course. And so we need, if we're talking about your position, we need for that to be a function of a single variable. Um, and so, um, and we need for your position to be a single, to be described by a single number. And that means that whenever we talk about motion, we're talking about motion in a straight line in this course, um, unless we explicitly say otherwise. So when we talk about a car, you know, the point of it traveling down a straight road is we're pretending the straight road is ideally a line. And so whenever we talk about motion, so we will, unless, except in very few cases where we explicitly say we're not moving in a straight line, we'll have motion in, in a straight line. 
And we always assume that we've laid out a coordinate axis that's that straight line. So you might call it the x-axis, the p-axis, the whatever axis. We assume we've laid out a coordinate axis that there's an origin somewhere, there's a positive direction, there's a negative direction. Um, and then the position, whether you call it x or p or what, the position, which is the, the coordinate on the axis. And the point is, it could be negative. It's, it's position. It is not your distance traveled. It's exactly where you are. So the point of the very first example I gave in having mile marker 37 and 38, it was just an axis. The road was an axis, and you were at x or p equals 37 and p equals 38. So the whole point, or part of the point that I'm trying to make now, and there aren't just integer values here, but is that uh, when we talk about position, we mean that it could be positive or negative and that somehow it's marked off from some origin and there's a positive direction and a negative direction. And so position is just your coordinate on that axis. Um, velocity then, so this is your position, and if an object is moving, it would be as a function of time. Average velocity, then as I said, is the change in position over the change in time. That's fine. And if you're given velocity as a function of time, but it would have to be instantaneous velocity. If v of t equals velocity, and we are going to have to, right now I'm assuming you have an intuitive concept of velocity, instantaneous velocity. You know, it's, uh, it's what you read off the speedometer of a car if you also pay attention to the direction. Um, if you have the velocity as a function of time, then um, the average acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Understand that velocity could be negative. Um, your average velocity could be negative, which would mean your position just went, you know, the, your final position is smaller than your initial position. So maybe your, your initial position was 2 and your final position was 1. Then your average velocity would be negative. And it would indicate that you moved in the negative direction on the axis. This instantaneous velocity, if it's positive, it means you're moving in the positive direction. If it's negative, means you're moving in the negative direction. We will define instantaneous velocity more carefully as some instantaneous rate of change of the position, but right now I'm appealing to your intuitive notion of the thing has velocity, and then the average acceleration is your change in velocity. This could be positive or negative too. It just depends whether your velocity is going up or down, you know, kind of your net, or your average velocity. Um, well, let's try that again. <laughs> <laughs> this could be positive or negative, depending on whether, I shouldn't have said average velocity, depending on whether your final velocity is bigger or smaller than your initial velocity. But, what is average speed? And now you have to be careful. In everyday speech, we kind of use speed and velocity interchangeably. Um, in math classes and in physics classes, it's very important that they're different. And I keep talking about what you read on a speedometer. Well, it's not called a velocitometer or something. It's a speedometer. It measures speed. Velocity includes a direction. Speed doesn't. And so your average speed is not, um, unlike your average velocity, it's not the cha change in position over the change in time. It is the change. So... It's, let me write delta. It's the change in distance traveled not position, but distance traveled divided by the change in time. And I want to give a quick example that really makes it clear that average velocity and average speed are different. Um,
So, if you're thinking, I don't understand the, the change in distance traveled, change in position, what difference does that make? All right. Let's look at it. Example. A car travels. On a straight road, but I'm not going to write it because we're talking about motion in a straight line. A car travels from point A to point B and then back to point A. I have two questions. What is was the average velocity of the car? And what was the average speed of the car? So if a normal human <laughs> were talking to you, and you told them that you went somewhere and came back, and they ask, oh, what was your average velocity? If you give them the actual math, correct, technically correct math physics answer, they'd probably punch you. Well, they probably not, but they wouldn't be very happy. Because you travel from point A to point B and then back to point A and you ask for the average velocity. The average velocity is the change in position over the change in time. But it's the entire change in position over the change in time. Well, the change in position during the whole trip, you went from point A and you ended up back at point A. The change in position here is zero. And assuming that you didn't do this in zero time, so that you actually did travel somewhere, which you couldn't do in zero time, it doesn't matter what delta t is. It's, if it's not zero, this is zero. And so the average velocity, zero, whatever the units are, miles per hour. Uh, um, and that's because your average velocity, you should think, well, I was going a positive velocity when I was going in a positive direction. When I turned around and came back, I, in, if you call the, the direction from A to B the positive direction, you're going in positive, at some positive velocity as you went from A to B, but the velocity from B to A is negative, and so your average velocity, those cancel out, and you end up with zero. Well, that's kind of annoying. If somebody asks you what your average velocity was during the trip, they probably wouldn't want you to say zero, but what they probably want, I like that word, aver, average, uh, average, um, what they probably meant to ask um, was, what was, your at, what was the average speed? And speed includes the distance traveled. Now, to answer this question, we have to have more data. So let's assume that it's um, 60 miles from point A to point B. So this distance is 60 miles. And that um, took three hours. To make the whole trip. Then, um, then you can answer the average speed because your total distance traveled, the sorry, the, your distance traveled, same as total distance traveled. Change in distance traveled. If you start, okay, well, when we start at A, we traveled no distance, but after we go from A to B and B back to A, the change in distance traveled. over the change in time. The distance traveled would be that 60 miles and the 60 miles back, so 120 miles, divided by the change in time, which is three hours, so 40 miles per hour. So, so that's your average speed. It's completely different from the average velocity. And the reason it's different is because average velocity takes direction into account and at some point the car turned around. If you were always traveling in the positive direction, 
then your average velocity and your average speed will be the same. But if the car, if whatever you're talking about, ever turns around, they're going to be different. All right. I want to do one last example of, now that we isolated the difference between average velocity and um, average speed, um, I want to do one last example of an average velocity problem. So, example. Uh, suppose the position of, I don't care what, a car, a particle, a banana, the position P of T in meters, in meters, P of T is minus 1.5 T squared plus 9T plus 5, um, where T is the time in seconds. And we'll say T is between 0 and 20. All right. So what do I want on like? What's the average velocity on the intervals zero three, two three, and three four? Well, hopefully, hopefully at this point, this question seems. Uh, Boringly obvious. It's uh, it hopefully. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe you expect me to do another one of these. They're so easy. So let's do it. So let me copy P of T again over here. So I have more space. Minus one point five. T squared plus 9t plus 5. All right. Um, so what do you do? You want the average velocity on the interval from 0 to 3. Average velocity is the change in position of the change in time. So we take p at time 3 minus p at time 0 over 3 minus 0. The units here are going to be p units divided by t units, so meters per second. What do you do? Well, you plug in 3 and you plug in 0 and you get whatever you get. You get minus 1.5 times 3 squared, so times 9, plus 9 times 3, plus 5, minus p at 0, minus p at 0, so that's minus 0 plus 0 plus 5, all divided by 3. And this is all divided by 3. And this comes out in meters per second. And what do you do? What do you do for the other two intervals? Exactly the same thing. It's, it's Kind of boring after a while. You just do the same thing over and over again. Um, oh, if you want a number for this, this comes out to be 4.5 meters per second. But what do you do on the interval from 2 to 3? Well, you put a 2 here and a 2 here. And then you calculate the analogous quantity. So down here you'll have a 1. And then P of 3 wouldn't change, but you put in um, P at 2. So here you wouldn't have this. You would have minus 1.5 times 2 squared plus 9 times 2 plus 5. And you subtract that. And this still comes out in meters per second. But now it's 1.5 meters per second. 
Okay, great. And finally, what would you do if you had to calculate on 3, 4? Well, the average velocity on 3, 4. Still the change in P over the change in T, the change in position over the change in time. But now you put a 4 here and a 3 here, and a 4 here and a 3 here. And I won't bother writing the expression again. You can just check what you end up with is minus 1.5 meters per second. Um, these calculations get pretty old after a while. Uh, my final comment is, is um, what does that minus sign mean? Well, it, the average velocity was negative. So it means that your final position was smaller than your initial position. So if you're thinking of the positive direction, you backed up. All right. Um, that's all I want to say about average rates of change. Our goal, you know, average rates of change, hopefully they seem kind of easy. Um, sometimes you have to do some, math, some algebra. Um, but it should, shouldn't seem too bad. Our goal, though, is to develop a notion of instantaneous rate of change. And that's where we're headed. It's, um, I already said you know, your velocity is your instantaneous velocity, and it should be you know, we have an average velocity, which is your change in position. What does instantaneous velocity mean? If you don't want to appeal to looking at your speedometer and knowing whether you're going in a positive or negative direction. And that's one of the things, that's one of our goals, to actually define instantaneous rates of change and have instantaneous velocity and instantaneous acceleration. We'll get there in the following section.